Good to see you all. Happy Easter. I was thinking about something this week a lot, actually. Growing up, I was told, my guess is you were told a lot of things. A lot of things that it was, it was just expected it would be accepted, right? Mom and dad said it, grandpa and grandma said it, your teacher said it, your pastor said it. And if they say it, you just got to believe it. You just got to go with it. It must be true. And we've based a lot of different parts of our lives on that, right? Over time, though, we start to realize that some of those things were borderline hoax in disguise. Like, some of us only behaved all year long because of a certain day in the middle or at the end of December, and that thing, we we needed, our parents needed that thing. We need that thing as parents because a good hoax, a good story can manipulate, it can control, and it can subdue. Like, that's why those things get put together. And it's built in when we're kids and we have parents or we have adult figures in our life that are telling us these things. But as we get to be adults, we start to explore the expected. We start to ask questions of it and poke around and wonder out loud, like, is there actually something to that? Does that hold water? Does that make sense? And a lot of times we end up with more questions than we do answers. Questions that can feel very unsettling and unnerving because if, if it's not true, then what does that mean? And then there's other times where we go, if it is true, well, well what does that mean? And one of those things that we're told as kids especially if we grew up in a church family or a Christian home. We were told that on Easter Sunday morning, Jesus came back to life. But as adults, we start to wonder, is that real? And the question we begin to ask is, did Jesus really come back to life? Did he, or is that something that's just been kind of passed on generation after generation after generation until we got to today, and we've just kind of accepted it blindly because a person standing on a platform at a church or a theater in downtown Kenosha said we should? Or is there something actually to it? I mean, the rational adult part of our mind thinks of it in a few ways. Like one, I mean, maybe one option would be that Jesus was actually hibernating. Like, he just kind of fell asleep up on that brutal cross. And when they pulled him down, they just didn't know. And when he got in the tomb and they rolled it shut, it was like, oh, now I'm going to wake up from this nap. That could be one way. It, it could be that they hid his body, right? Like after they rolled the tomb closed and everybody went about their business, somebody snuck out in the dead of night, pushed the tomb back open and grabbed the body and went and hid it somewhere else. With both of these options, though, I have some questions like, If Jesus was just sleeping and he never died, at some point he would have had to die and nobody ever found that body. And if they just took his body out of the tomb and they went and hid it somewhere, they would have found the body. I mean, we we don't leave anything hidden for very long, especially in our day and age. We can find almost anything. I mean, maybe another option would be, hey, the followers of Jesus that were there, they they were so distraught and so broken and so mentally destroyed when he died that they hallucinated he came back to life. Like they were just seeing things that weren't actually there. But again, if, if that were the case, somebody would have gone, hey, you know what? The tomb's right over there. We, I mean, they're saying all this. Let's just go check. And yet you don't ever hear that somebody went to the tomb and found the body. So for me, the next question I have to start struggling my way through is, so what if he didn't? What if he didn't come back to life? What, what if he did die and never came back? Or, or what if he really wasn't anybody to begin with? It raises three other questions for me. Uh, first question, why have we ever heard of Jesus in the first place then? Think about it. We're talking about a guy from a town called Nazareth in the middle of Israel back in the very first century, son of an obscure carpenter, supposedly born out of wedlock at least. And Like, why would we know about Jesus at all? 
Do you know how many people Rome crucified? He would have just been one of the thousands and thousands. And yet somehow we know that name. What's even weirder to me is that we all know that name. And we started gathering together in that name. And Christianity has survived for millennia, thousands of years. The fact that Christianity made it out of the first century when it was illegal and you could die for believing it, that's a miracle in and of itself. It's crazy to me that Christianity exists if Jesus didn't come back from the dead. And thirdly, like, why is there controversy at all? If he didn't, we would know it, and it would be the end of the discussion. And yet, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, we have debated, is it true? Is it real? What really happened or didn't happen that day? It's absurd to me. Well, I mean, really, the resurrection's less absurd to me than the existence of Christianity. I go so far as to say, The resurrection isn't an absurdity, it explains one. To me, the only rational excuse for the church or Christianity existing at all, all of these years later, is that something happened. Something happened that day that changed everyone and everything. It's not so far-fetched. I mean, the resurrection when you look at the facts, is actually a rational explanation for all of this. But the rise of Christianity, it overcoming all of the roadblocks against it, that doesn't make sense. There's no rational explanation unless it's true. Unless he actually did come back from the dead. Now, if you've been going to church on this Sunday for your whole life, and I know, I get it, like a lot of us, we, we, we come on Easter because mom told us we had to. And that's fair. That's why I went to church for a long time. And you might go, well, you're only here because it's your job. And that's true too. But I'm also here because I really, I believe this, but the, the hard part about that, this becoming a tradition, is that we've, re- we've read through the story a hundred times. We, we kind of know it. But there's a few parts in there that I want to spend an extra minute on that to me show and speak to the idea that this isn't as crazy as it sounds at first glance. Luke was a doctor and he had done all of this research on Jesus. He had heard about Jesus. He wasn't one of his disciples. He came along a little bit later. But he went around and interviewed eyewitnesses, the people that were closest to Jesus, people that were close to the people that were close to Jesus, people that didn't even like Jesus. He went around and he interviewed them all, and he wrote a biography that we call the Gospel of Luke. But he, in great detail, records that day that Jesus exited the tomb. This is how he starts it when he writes it. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. This is important because nobody was expecting the tomb to be empty, right? None of his closest followers were at the tomb going, any second now, here comes Jesus. They were going expecting to find a dead body that they were going to prepare for burial. What they found was that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. Imagine for a minute what this would have been like. We've all probably lost somebody we loved. Can you imagine going to the cemetery and realizing that that they weren't there anymore? That they were walking around? I mean, this would have been absolutely horrifying. We read it and we kind of go, this is the nice Easter story and the grave is empty and yay! Yay! but we're talking about a missing, dead body. These women would have been so perplexed and so put off. And again, if they're just saying it, if if they're just going, hey, we went to the tomb today and it was empty, and they're making the whole thing up because they probably, you know, they thought to themselves, we're going to pull off the greatest hoax of all time. And we're going to start with one little lie. Let's go tell Peter that the tomb is empty. 
In a minute, Peter will run to the tomb. He would have found that the stone had not been rolled away and that there was, in fact, a dead body in there. And the Roman soldiers guarding that said tomb would go, yeah, nothing's happened here. Dude's still in there dead. So if they're just saying it, anybody could have run over there to prove that they were lying. So you might go, well, maybe they're making it. Like, they're, they're fabricating the whole thing. These ladies, and this is not a, this, I'm not making a joke, I'm just saying, like, these ladies went over there in the middle of the night and pushed this huge stone to the side and then carried the dead body somewhere else? Have you ever carried a dead body around? I hope the answer is no. I, that was a dumb question. It's not an easy thing to do, I imagine. And yet they did it without anybody seeing And again, at some point, somebody would have been like, oh, here's the missing body of Jesus. So I don't think they're making it, which leaves us with maybe that's actually it. Maybe it is actually empty. Maybe it is actually the story. Maybe it is fact. And they're not making anything up. Now, Peter, being Peter, is going to come check it out in a second. But before, the ladies have a chance to run and tell Peter something else happens. This is what Luke says. As they stood there puzzled, and we won't fault them for that because we would be just as puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Understand, we always think, like, it would be so cool to see an angel, and if I could just see an angel, then I would believe. No one who has ever seen an angel said that. Anytime you read about anybody seeing an angel, they are freaked out, flat on the ground. Please don't kill me, Mr. Angel. And that's exactly what happens with these women standing there puzzled about where is Jesus. And then the men turn to them and they ask, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. And then they go, Remember, do you remember? Think about this. Remember when he told you back in Galilee that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and that he would rise again, not one, not two, but three days later. Ladies, he did it. He died three days ago. It's the third day. Why weren't you here counting is kind of what they're starting to insinuate. And the women begin to remember what was taught to them. So... They rushed back from the tomb to tell the 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. Now, the next part is hugely important. It's usually the part that everybody just blazes through and considers it inconsequential. To me, it's of utter sheer consequence. This is what Luke records next. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. If you are making something up, you don't name names. Because somebody's going to go talk to that name. They'll go, I know Joanna. I'm going to go talk to her about what, she, what you're saying she said. Because understand, Luke wrote this in probably A.D. 60. Jesus likely died in A.D. 33. We're not entirely positive, but it was somewhere right around that time frame. There's two things that are important here. Those names that that Luke named, they're still alive when he writes Luke. So anybody reading it went, oh my gosh, Joanna and Mary and Mary, and I know them. Let's go have a chat. And when they did, Mary and Mary and Joanna said, That's exactly how it happened. And what's crazy is, in that time, understand that women were considered second-class citizens. Thank God things have changed. But back then, their testimony was not admissible in a court of law. Their story didn't count. So again, if you're Luke trying to pull off the greatest hoax of all time. You're not going to bank the whole story on people who say can't tell the story that counts. 
And he had 25 some odd years. He could have taken some creative license and left the names out, left the gender out. It would have made it just a little more believable for people who were reading it. And this is why, by the way, I trust scripture because it never leaves out the parts that we might look at and go, that's not the best choice. It's full of people who get it wrong. It's full of people who do it wrong several times in a row. It's got all kinds of parts that you go, they wouldn't have included that if there weren't some truth to it. So Luke doesn't leave the names out. And in case you're wondering, one of the things that makes Jesus so amazing is that the the center of his story, he puts on the shoulders of women. It's Jesus that elevates the role of women, elevates the value of women as time goes on. Because it was those women that went and told the guys. And here's what they meet. The story sounded like nonsense to the men. Of course it did, right? So they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings Then he went home again, wondering what happened. What's interesting to me is it says Peter is wondering. Peter, who had walked around with Jesus for all those years. Peter, who was considered one of the closest three disciples. Peter, Peter who had walked on water for a second with Jesus, seen Jesus do all the things that he did. And instead of Peter going, well, I know what happened. He's alive. That's what he said he would do. Instead, I picture Peter walking home going, I just don't get it. Who would have taken his body? Where would his body be? Did he not, did he not die? I mean, I was there. I saw him. I watched them beat him to a bloody pulp. I watched it happen. And even if the cross hadn't killed him, the beatdown would have killed him. But then I was there when they nailed him to the cross and they put him up in the air. I watched him struggle to breathe. I watched him take his last breath. I was there when they shoved the spear into his side to make sure that it was done. I saw that those Roman soldiers that executed him were professionals. I know they've done this a thousand times before. They they never would have let him off the cross if he weren't dead. And then I followed, I I remember Joseph of Arimathea coming in and saying, I have a tomb. And him taking the body, and I remember watching them put him in the tomb and roll the thing shut. What could have happened? So in case you're ever wondering, is it okay with God that we wrestle and we don't have it sure all the time and we have questions? Peter's proof that yes, as he recounts the steps from the cross to the tomb, He's not going, of course, Jesus is alive. He's wondering, is it real? And that's what everybody's wondering. So they get together and they're talking about, what are we going to say? What are we going to do? What's going to happen next? This is not good. We we need to figure out like a company line. We need to figure out how we're going to respond when people find out. And as they're talking about this. And as the women are telling the story of what they'd experienced, and Peter's coming in and going, the I, I, I went. He's gone. This is what Luke says happened next. Just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they, he was a ghost. Like, again, we read this and we're like, it's Easter, yay, Jesus is back. For anybody there, they were like, oh my gosh, Jesus is back. (laughs) It's a ghost. But Jesus says, why are you frightened? By the way, I never read this with Jesus having, like, a mad tone. I don't think it was like, why are you afraid? I told you. Like, I told you several times. It's, why are you frightened? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. These holes, they're real. 
and look at my feet. That's real. He says, you can see. You can see that it's really me. Touch me. That's, that's the ace in the hole. He does, it's not just look at me. It's go ahead, touch me. Because you can't touch a hallucination. Remember watching Looney Tunes back in the day when Bugs Bunny would go through the desert and he'd see the oasis and he'd crawl over there and he'd go to touch it and it was gone. You can't touch something that's not there. And Jesus says, go ahead, you can lay hands on me because here's what I know that you know. Ghosts don't have bodies. And you can see that I do. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands and feet. Do you remember the last time a friend or a family member sat you down and they were telling you an outlandish story, like a really hard to believe story, and they get all done and you give them that look like, that's not true. You know what they, remember what they said? Well, I saw it with my own eyes. And you're like, yeah, but our eyes can deceive us. I was pretty sure I lost 10 pounds and then I got on the scale. They'll always take it to the next level. Yeah, 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 but I was actually there. I touched it. I touched them. It's real. If there's a hierarchy of how you can prove it, there's like, I saw it, and then there's, I touched it. Like the second somebody can say that, where they were actually able to handle it, put their hands around it, they're not making that up. They're not just seeing things or imagining things or having some crazy wishful thinking moment. It was real. And if you know the story, Jesus starts showing up everywhere. It says for 40 days, actually, he would show up and he'd hang out with different people and talk to people and all of a the sudden, there are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands and thousands of people going around saying, hey, Jesus, you remember Jesus, the guy they crucified on the side of the street outside Jerusalem? He's not dead anymore. Here's what's crazy. He said he was going to die, and he said three days later he was going to come back to life. I'm going with whatever he says from now on. And you should too. And it was getting out of control. It was getting totally unruly for everybody in charge of anything. So the government, the religious leaders, they're starting to freak out. And so they decide we have to shut it down. These people are giving way too much hope to all the people that we're trying to control. And it's really hard to control hope. So let's make it illegal to be a Christian. And Luke, in his second book, what we call Acts, or that's usually short for Acts of the Apostles, which is kind of how the church became the church. This is what he writes at one point. He says, a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all of the believers except the apostles were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. But Saul, and this Saul, by the way, became Paul Later, it's amazing what an encounter with living Jesus can do for you. But Saul was going around trying to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. Would you die for something you knew wasn't true? Nobody dies. Nobody dies for something that they know isn't a fact. You would only die for something, I mean, this is why we say, like, I'll die on a hill for that. Because you know it to be true in your bones and no one can convince you otherwise. But if you're just making it up, and here's the thing, None of the disciples, none of Jesus' followers made it up because none of them changed the story when they were faced with death. Just look at this list. Matthias was crucified. James 
killed by sword. Thaddeus shot to death with arrows. Philip crucified. Thomas put to death with a spear. Peter crucified, probably upside down. Bartholomew was beheaded. Matthew was killed with a sword. Andrew crucified. Do you think they were making this up? Nobody dies for something they're making it up. Nobody dies brutally for something they're making up. Now, I know this. I know this is true because I have four sons. And there have been times where my children, believe it or not, have done things that aren't good. (laughs) They've broken things or done things that I told them not to do or gone places that I've told them not to go. And what I will often do is line the four of them up. And I will say, listen, somebody better fess up to what happened or you're all going down. Because what they've been saying is, well, we don't know. Who broke this? I don't know. You telling me magic elves broke into our house and smashed all this stuff and then disappeared? Maybe. We don't, we don't know. All right, well, here's the deal. If somebody doesn't tell me the truth, you're all losing your cell phone, which might as well be death to a teenager. It's amazing how quick they go, it was him. Him. Right here, him. And all three of the other guys will do it. It was, it was him. Definitely him. Because you're not going down for something you're making up. Even if it's as simple as a cell phone. Ratchet that up to being killed, executed on something like a cross. To me, this is the most compelling reason for it to be true. Over and over again, this, that list I showed you, that's the short version. And that kind of persecution lasted for 300 years before Constantine made Christianity the official religion of Rome. How do you explain that? This is why I say the resurrection isn't an absurdity. It's the explanation of one. The reason people died, the reason it survived, the reason you and I are sitting here today is because something happened. Something real happened. And it so radically changed people See, the resurrection gave people an unbelievable amount of hope. And it's really that hope that's propelled this message throughout all of these years. Hope that there's more to life than life. Hope that someone loves you so much that they would die for you and then overcome death. Hope that there is a God in the universe that knows your name. Hope that Jesus wasn't just a random guy from Nazareth, but was God himself. And that he showed us how to live the best version of life. And when you have that kind of hope, hope is not easy to control. If the resurrection was a hoax, then it was the worst hoax ever. You go, well, wait a minute. A lot of us still believe it's true. That kind of makes it a good one. The problem with this hoax, this resurrection, is it sets us free. Remember, a good hoax controls, subdues, and manipulates. Jesus walks out of the tomb, and you and I are set free. There's nothing controlling us in that way. We might choose to change our life, but there's no demand on that. That hope is why for me, the symbol of my faith, the symbol of my relationship with God is, it's not the cross. It's an empty tomb. Because if Jesus had just died, this is ridiculous. Paul said it's insanity, it's silliness. The reason that I'm here and that you're here 
is because the cross was not the end of the story. And so we have to get to the place where we understand that the truth is it's an empty tomb with a vacancy sign above it. Like, there's nobody in here. The resident of this tomb got up and left. So we have an opening. For me, that's the promise. That's the best part. That's the reason for all of this. Which means you and I are left with just three options, three choices. Choice number one, we can ignore it. We can decide this is not worth the brain power, this isn't worth the emotion, this isn't worth the discussion, there's there's better things I can do with my time. I'm just gonna ignore it, sweep it under the rug. The problem is, as we try to enter that door, we realize that this door is locked. You you can't ignore it. At some point, we have to make a decision about Jesus dying and coming back to life. Just like they did in the first days. Everybody that heard Jesus is not dead was faced with this choice. Well, what does that mean for me? And on one hand, we could deny it. We could decide it didn't happen. It was made up. Jesus was sleeping. They moved his body. They hallucinated. I'm going to go into this room. And for me, the problem with this room is you still have to explain the absurdity of Christianity, of the church. You have, to, you have to come to grips then with the insanity that there's a controversy at all. The problem is in this place, it can get pretty dark and pretty lonely. Or we can accept it. And what's amazing about accepting it, what's amazing about an empty tomb where the stone has been rolled away is that where in either of these options, we may have been thinking about walking into a space Accepting it means we get to come out of a space. And we get to walk into light. We, we get to walk into promise. We get to walk into hope. We talk a lot about following Jesus means literally walking in his footsteps. And oftentimes it ends at a cross. There's sacrifice for people that you love and that's who Jesus was. But his footsteps also walk out of a tomb. And we sang a song not long ago here this morning. I walked out of that grave. We're all coming into this day, this year, with death in our life. And for some of us, that's literal. We've lost people we love. For others of us, it's a job, a relationship, an experience. Something has died, something, or just the joy, or whatever it is. We've all got that space. And it's Jesus that says, follow me. There's there's actually life on the other side of that death. You don't got to stay in there. Just follow me. There is life where there was no life before. And that, that's hope. A closing thought for you. Naturalism, which a lot of us would maybe adhere to. We would say that everything came from nothing. Another way to put it would be all life came from no life. Is it really that crazy then that I might believe a life came back from no life? Is it really that much of a stretch if so many of us already believe that all of life came from nothing? Maybe it's more natural than we think. Maybe it's less absurd than we assumed. See, for me, the resurrection is not an absurdity. It explains one. It explains why this is a thing at all. Let's pray. Jesus, 
it almost seems silly to say thank you for doing something that we don't even fully comprehend and something that we don't really understand was accomplished through it. But we are grateful that we can talk to you and move through life with you and that you are alive, that you are with us. You're not dead, that you walked out of a tomb and you offer that same path to each of us. You, you remind us that y- there is life after death. And not just in a go to heaven kind of way, but in a here and now making our way through our work life and our family life and our life life. And we're grateful that you didn't leave us in a tomb and that you didn't stay there either. So God, we're going to sing a song that does a way better job of putting words around our gratitude for who you are and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.